Hello. Today we're going to discuss the human heart. We know the heart is a muscular pump and this particular pump pumps blood throughout the body since every single cell in the body needs oxygen. Okay. Now if you hold your hand like this, you can see that this is approximately the size of the heart. It is found behind the sternum. Okay. And in this particular model here, it's, it's a giant heart, but in fact, the heart is as big as your fist. This is a smaller version of this big dark model here, and it's found in the middle of the body, in behind the sternum, in the thoracic cavity. And in the thoracic cavity, particularly what we call the pericardial cavity. Okay? So they say the size of your fist approximates the size of your heart. Now, so it keeps the blood in motion because it keeps on continuously pumping, it does not stop. The only time it will stop if you go into cardiac arrest. And of course, if your heart stops pumping blood, there is no blood to the brain, you become unconscious, there is no pulse, you stop breathing and you are now clinically dead. No pulse, no breathing, and you become unconscious, okay? So take note of these, it beats around 100,000 times per day, can you imagine that? 100,000 times per day. And the normal heart rate ranges from 60 to 100 beats per minute. Less than 60 beats per minute means what? Brady cardiac, Brady means slow. On the other hand, if the heartbeat is more than 100 beats per minute, it's called tachycardia. So normal is 60 to 100, below 60, like 59 and below, Brady cardia. 101 and above is tachycardia. So the amount being pumped is 1.5 million gallons per year of blood and at about 2.9 gallons per minute. So can you imagine the amount of blood being pumped? So the heart, as you can see here, has four chambers. The first one would be the right atrium. Okay. And as you can clearly see here, let me use a pointer here. So this is the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and of course the left ventricle. Okay, so there are four chambers on the right. You have the right atrium, and you have the right ventricle there. Here you have the left atrium, the left ventricle. The right side is separated from the left side by what we call the interatrial septum to prevent the mixing of blood. On the right side, the blood is rich in carbon dioxide. And on the left, it, the blood is rich in oxygen because it came from the lung. The one on top here is called the superior vena cava. The one below here where my fingers are is called the inferior vena cava. Okay, there. Over here. And then this is called the aorta, which came from the left ventricle. And the pulmonary trunk comes from the right ventricle. Now, the pulmonary trunk divides into the pulmonary artery into the left lung and pulmonary artery to the right lung, which is found here, see? Now, on the other hand, from the lungs, the blood goes back via the pulmonary veins. There are two on the left, and then there are what? Two on the right. So one, two, two to the right, from the, and of course two on the left side, okay? So this is just uh, an idea of what happens here in terms of the heart. Yes. And of course, as we said, because of the fact that the blood is moving from the heart to the lungs and from the lungs back to the heart, and then from the heart, in particular the left atrium, the left ventricle goes to the systemic circuit. So you have the pulmonary and the systemic circuit. So this is what the heart looks like. So I've shown you the superior vena cava there. This is the pulmonary trunk that divides into the left and right pulmonary artery. This is your aorta which came from the left ventricle here. And notice that if it's red, it's cool. blood is rich in oxygen. If it's blue, that means the blood is venous blood, which means the blood is rich in carbon dioxide. Now this is the interior view of the heart. Right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. On the other hand, in this particular view, it's posterior view. Left ventricle, right, left atrium, right atrium. You can see the pulmonary artery going to the left lung and the right lung. And of course, you have here the pulmonary veins. There are four of them. 
So the artery is above the pulmonary veins, and that would be part of the aorta. Now, so in other words, this is just to show you that the heart really plays a very important role in pumping blood throughout the body. Anything that's blue is called veins. So you have your systemic veins, and of course you have the systemic arteries that brings blood to every single cell and organ in the body. So it's like a 405 North, 405 or 5 North, 5 South freeway. Venous blood is blue, arterial blood rich in oxygen is red. Okay, so, so bear in mind that in the lung the, the terminology may not apply like arteries in the systemic circulation are red, but in the case of the pulmonary circuit, the arteries, particularly the pulmonary arteries are blue. And that's the reason why the pulmonary tract gives rise to blue, two pulmonary trunks, uh, in, in, it's, as I said a while ago, right? And in the case of the, the blood coming from the lung, going back to the left atrium, it has to the four pulmonary veins. So, tartaries, the word A for artery, A for away from the heart, okay. and then veins to the heart, to the superior and inferior vena cava, as you can see there. And what connects an arterial, uh, which is a small artery, and a venial, which is a small vein, is a capillary, which is the smallest blood vessel, connecting both arterials and venials. So the heart, as, also, as, as we know, is protected by a uh, connective tissue membrane called the pericardium. It has two parts, fibrous, which is the outer part, and the serous pericardium. The serous pericardium, just like any serous membrane, secretes serous fluid. In this case, it's called pericardial fluid, and it has two components, visceral pericardium and parietal. So the outer layer is a parietal layer. Now, the visceral layer is actually part of the wall of the heart. It's called the epicardium. That is, therefore, the other name of your visceral layer on the surface of the heart. And then what is near the parietal fibers will be the parietal layer. So whatever space you find between the visceral and parietal layer is called the pericardial cavity, which contains pericardial fluid, which is designed to act as a lubricant. Lubrication is necessary because you want to reduce the friction every time the heart pumps blood. Ching, 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 ching. You don't want any friction to occur, okay? We cannot prevent it, but at least we can reduce the amount of friction. So it lubricates to reduce friction. So reduce means does not mean nothing, but there will still be, but reduction is present. Reduction of the friction. So as you can see here, the heart is in the middle of the thoracic cavity, slightly elevated to the left. It is in between the two lungs. The right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes. And as you can see here, it's important to be able to know that it is also resting on top of your diaphragm, which is the primary muscle for breathing. Uh, by the way, before I forget, the, the, the apex is the bottom portion of the heart. It's approximately in the fifth intercostal space, left mid-clavicular line, the med clavicle, mid-clavicular, and then apex would be there. Uh, fifth intercostal space, that's the approximate location. So here is a demonstration of what is meant by two-layer visceral and parietal layer with a pericardial cavity in between the two of them. So this is the one that contains your what? Pericardial fluid for lubrication. So in the wall of the heart, our the wall of the heart has three layers. First one is called the what? Endocardium, which is lining the wall. Then the thickest layer would be the myocardium, which happens to be the thickest portion of the wall. And of course, your epicardium, which happens to be the visceral pericardium, is very important. And again, of all the layers, the thickest layer is the myo because it's a muscular pump, right? And um, one thing to note is that in the lecture on muscles, the cardiac muscles are unique because they are involuntary, and therefore they are important in the bringing about contraction of the heart, okay? So here is a histological um, organization of the muscle within the heart wall. As you can clearly see here, the thickness is obvious because it is the main function of the heart. You have the endocardium with the endothelium, the myo, uh, myocardium, and of course the visceral layer of the pericardium, which happens to be also known as the epicardium. So these are just, I want you to read on these, the features that are unique to the muscle tissue in the heart. Um, straightened appearance, although it's not as heavily straightened as the skeletal muscle, dependent on aerobic respiration. That's a mitochondria, which is important for the production of ATP, which requires oxygen too. 
And of course, the very important thing is that cardiac muscle cells contract without information from the CNS or central nervous system, which is the brain. It's the reason why it's called involuntary. In other words, the heart cannot be stopped by the brain, but of course, the brain through the medulla oblongata, which is happens to be the cardiac center, can actually regulate the heartbeat. You can either make it faster, which is cardiac acceleration, or you can make it beat slower, which is called as deceleration, which could be less than 60 bits per minute or bradycardia. Now, another important consideration is that muscle cells in the heart are interconnected by intercalated discs. So these are unique features that are only found in the heart muscle. Very important consideration. So this is what it looks like in terms of the cardiac muscle cells. The intercalated discs are shown. And of course, this is the one that binds the myofibrils of the adjacent cells together. Very, very important. And the presence of cell-to-cell -cell junctions because you need to be able to make the muscles contract in a very effective manner together also with the gap junctions. So again, you can see here the organization of the heart muscle wall. So just be familiar, I don't expect you to memorize this diagram here. And of course, the cardiac skeleton, its cardiac cell is wrapped in elastic sheath. And in, in this case, the muscle layer is wrapped in the fiber sheath at the same time, which separates the superficial layer from the deep layer muscles. So this is very important, okay? So again, I don't have to read this for you. You can just read the important role played by this cardiac skeleton. The first one here is stabilized position of cardiac cells and heart valves. All these are very, very important. And just be aware of these functions of the cardiac skeleton. Now, as I said, what is the apex found in the bottom? And the base is in the superior border of the heart. The exact location of the apex is fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line. The right border is formed with the right atrium and the inferior border is the right ventricle. And as you can see, these are both anterior posterior surfaces and they are phragmatic surfaces because as I have said, it is resting on top of the diaphragm. And again, be aware of the anterior surface. So best be familiar with this chambers of the heart and then the posterior surface will be of the left atrium and the portion of the right atrium. So as I said, where is the heart found? It is behind the sternum, and it is slightly deviated to the left. This is the apex, which is five fifth intercostal space. That space is between the fifth and sixth rib. And if you were to note, the clavicle is there. See, so fifth intercostal space, left mid clavicular line. So superior border on top, apex below. Right border, left border, inferior border. Now, in the case of the chore forte of the heart, in the in the, if I were to put back this wall here. You can see that there are grooves and what we call sulcus. And uh, if you say interatrial, it means in between the right and left atria. It's a groove there. Coronary sulcus separating the atria and the ventricles. And of course, you have either anterior ventricular sulcus separating the left or right ventricles. And at the back, you still have the same posterior interventricular sulcus. So, so again, these are important um, components of or structures within the human heart. Now, in terms of position, just be familiar with them. This, the walls that are always thick would always be found in the ventricles, but if you were to compare right and left, it's always the left ventricular wall. It's much thicker because it's the main pump. The ventricular walls compared to the atrial walls, both left and right are thinner walls. Now this expanded portion called auricle, it is a word that means related to the ear. It's like an appearance of the ear is part of the left atrium and right atrium. And what separates the two? Right and left atrium and ventricles would be a septum. It could either be the interatrial septum between the right and left atrium and interventricular septum between the right and left ventricles. There are also valves found here, so in this particular slide, uh, a model here. The valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle is called the tricuspid valve, T-R-I-C-U-S-P-I-D. And between the left atrium and the left ventricle is the bicuspid, otherwise known as mitral valve. And then at the same time, you have your pulmonary valve, which I will show you in a short while. See, the pulmonary valve is the blue pulmonary trunk and pulmonary valve there. And that is your aortic valve, of course, in the aorta. Okay, there you are. So notice it has three casts, one, two, three, one, two, three, and tricuspid valve has three casts. 
the one in the bicuspid mean bindings too, is found only in the mitral or bicuspid valve. Okay? So valves are important because they, they do two things. One, they prevent backflow or what we call regurgitation. Once the blood enters the right atrium, it should never be allowed to go back where? From the right atrium to the right ventricle, it should never be allowed to go back from the right ventricle to the right atrium, okay? And of course, they are also secondly important for allowing the blood to flow in one direction, okay? So that's very important, see? So if the blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle, the valves prevent backflow. So this is tricuspid valve, that is the pulmonary semilunar valve, semilunar means half moon, and then, of course, that is your what? Mitral or bicuspid valve. Now, it's, you cannot see here, but that's the aortic valve there. Notice that the wall of the left ventricle is much, much thicker compared to the right ventricle. And the walls of the atrium are much thinner compared to both the ventricular walls. So, what enters the right atrium would be the right atrium as the superior inferior vena cava, together with the coronary sinus. The atrium has pectinate muscles. And of course, uh, this is a remnant of what we call the foramen ovale, which connects the right and left atrium. It's called now fossa ovalis. So that is the fossa ovalis there. This is used to be an opening between the right and left atrium when during the, the fetal life of fetus inside the mother's womb. And of course, this is the superior inferior vena cava. So all the veins in the head and neck and upper limbs, they go here bringing via venous blood. All the veins from the feet, the leg, the thigh, and the organs below the heart, like the rock abdominal pelvic organs, they go via the inferior vena cava. The blood passes to the right atrium, passes to the valve, cannot backflow because of the valve's function, and goes into the pulmonary valve, then into the pulmonary trunk, into the left lung, and the right lung valve of the pulmonary uh, arteries. So there is only one artery, but it begins to divide there, but these are only uh, one pulmonary artery and one pulmonary artery on the right. So what the lung is where the exchange of gases will take place, you get rid of the carbon dioxide by exhaling it, and then when you inhale, you bring in oxygen, and you can see here, the blood goes back via the four pulmonary veins, two on the left lung and two on the right lung, as you can see, and then when the blood enters the left atrium, it goes now into the mitral valve, left ventricle, then it pumps into the aortic valve and aorta. So again, the atrioventricular valve on the right is tricuspid, on the left is bicuspid. And of course you have your pulmonary valves. Now in the right ventricle, the right atrioventricular valve or what we call tricuspid valve has popular muscles via chordae tendinae. So it's not very clear here, but these are the chordae tendinae here. They are attached to the cast. And take note that these are fibrous flaps or cast and, three, and they have three popular muscles attached to them. Each of the three calculated by the cordy tendon into popular muscles. So it's very important, the popular muscles and cordy prevent valve inversion when the valves contract. So you can see here, there's a cordy tendon A, there's a popular muscle, same thing with the left side, cordy tendon A, there's a cast, and that would be your popular muscle. Okay. In the ventricles, you have what we call trabeculate carnate, cardiac meat. Now, moderator band is only found in the right ventricle. See, very important. Muscular band that extends from the interventricular septum to the ventricular wall. Take note, whenever you see the word function, prevents overexpansion of the thin wall right ventricle. So, again, that is the moderator band there. Prevent overexpansion of the thin wall right atrium. Now, from the lungs, the blood goes back to the heart via the left atrium through the four pulmonary veins. And then between the left and right atrium, you have your um, uh, bicuspid or what you call mitral valve. And that is the mitral valve there. And then again, because it is the main part of the thickest wall, need for strong contraction because it is designed to pump blood throughout the body via the aorta and the respective arteries does not have a moderator band because where is it found? Only in the right ventricle. And then of course the trabecular carnae are prominent just like in the right ventricle. But the left AV valve has cordic tendinae connecting only two caps. 
Now from the left ventricle, it goes to the aortic seminal valve, then ascending aorta arch of the aorta, and then eventually descending aorta. So this is the aorta ascending because it goes up, arch, because it forms an arch, and then it goes down, forming the descending aorta found at the back, which eventually pierces the diaphragm and then becomes the abdominal aorta. So this is just a comparison between the right and left ventricles. Which one is the thickest wall or thicker wall? The left ventricle with powerful contractions, six or seven times more powerful than the right ventricle. So this is actually a cadaver uh, heart, and you can see here the, um, the septum. And you can see here the valves with their cordy tendinae and papillary muscles, see? Cordy tendinae, papillary muscles. So you can see here uh, basically the aorta and the brachiocephalic tract, which is only found on the right side, by the way. And on the left, you have here the left common carotid and left subclavian artery. So again, there are two atrioventricular valves, tricuspid and bicuspid, and again, you have two semilunar valves, basically your aortic and pulmonary valves. What are their functions? Again, one, prevent backflow or what we call regurgitation. At the same time, the second one would be to allow the blood to flow in one direction. So these are just uh, it, if you bulk it is in four parts, connective tissue ring, cast, cordy, and tendinae, and papillary muscles. So just be familiar with their functions of each of these structural components. So as I already mentioned a while ago, why is it mitral or bicuspid? Because you have two cast, one, two. On the other hand, tricuspid has one, two, and three. And both pulmonary and aortic valves have three cast, two. One, two, three, one, two, three just like your tricuspid valve one, two, three. So in other words, of all the four valves, it is only the martial valve that has two casts. So here it is. So popular to the left atrium and left ventricle. So again, in the, in the factor of the heart valve, this is something very important. I want you to study this very closely. So um, AV valve factor during the cardiac cycle and the pop popillary muscles relax due to pressure in the atrium, AV valves open flow from the right atrium to the left, uh, right ventricle, left atrium to the, at the same time, which means that it has to contract both right and left atrium at the same time. And when the ventricles contract, causes the valves to close and the seminal valve to open to bring it, in the case of the right ventricle, to the lung, and in the case of the left ventricle, into the aortic arch. So again, uh, see, one, two, three for tricuspid, one, two for bicuspid valve, or otherwise known as mitral valve. Now, what brings blood supply to the myocardium? Now, this is very important because if we're dealing with a, a myocardial infarction, or let's say heart attack, these are the structures that get that gets obstructed by two things, either fat deposits or blood clots, which causes the muscle cells to die. That's why it's called infarct. Myocardial infarct means death of the muscle tissue called the myocardium. So the right and left coronary, so just remember it's very easy, just I have two hands, left and right, same thing, I have two arteries, they are called coronary, left and right coronary arteries with different branches. So if you can memorize this, why not, you know? But the two major ones are right and left. So left has circumflex, marginal, and anterior intravicular branch, and right has also these three other branches. So again, uh, take note, uh, there are different branches atrial, right, vaginal, posterior, interventricular for the right. So you see that? So this is the right coronary artery, the atrial branches, and of course this is called the marginal branch. And in the case of the left coronary artery, left anterior interventricular branch, and then of course you have your circumflex branch. See? So this is circumflex goes to the back, and this is the anterior interventricular branch. Some books refer to this as the left anterior descending because descending means go down anterior means front okay and at the back you have your posterior left ventricular which is a branch of the left coronary artery now the heart's veins they don't call them coronary vein but we, we actually call them coronary vein in this particular slide but rather cardiac cardiac veins there's only one coronary sinus because all the veins in the heart will eventually drain here and this will drain into the right atrium which is very important. So again, these are the cor coronary veins or cardiac veins. Uh, you have all these, which your veins, small cardiac and anterior cardiac veins. Okay, so the cardiac veins are in blue because just like any organ, they have both arteries and veins. 
the arteries carry oxygenated blood which is needed by the myocardial cells and these cells in turn produce carbon dioxide that will be drained by the cardiac veins. And all the veins, as you can see here, will drain into the coronary sinus, which will, of course, bring the blood richer carbon dioxide into the right atrium. Now, the word systole or systole means muscle contraction, diastole means muscle relaxation. So just be familiar with the term called cardiac cycle, alternating periods of contraction and relaxation when the muscles contract. It's called systole or systole when the muscles relax. It's called diastole or diastole. So in atrial systole, blood flows into the ventricles. In ventricular systole, the blood goes into the lungs, via the pulmonary trunk, and of course the aorta, to so the other organs of the body. And relaxation is a word, it has to do with the word diastole. And this is the time when the blood is filling the chambers. Now, just be familiar with this cardiac cycle and the, the conducting system made up of the pacemakers of the heart, SA node, AV node, bundle of and Purkinje fibers. But uh, just go, I don't expect you to memorize this, but just take note that either they contract and relax, and again, be familiar with this particular slide. So, in order for the muscles to contract, you have to have a pacemaker. It's the one that stimulates the muscles to contract. So you have two kinds of conducting cells, nodal and conducting cells. These are the SA node, AV node, and of course, establish the rates of contractions and you have your conduction cells. So, what is the primary pacemaker of the heart? It's called the SA node or the sinoatrial node. It will automatically generate 80 to 100 potentials, actual potential of electrical stimulus per minute. Anything below 60 bits per minute is bradycardia. Anything below or above 100 is tachycardia. So from the SA node, the electrical impulse, or what we call action potentials, will go to the AV node. Now the SA node is found in the posterior wall of the right atrium near the entrance of the superior vena cava. While the AV node is in the floor of the right atrium. So be aware of that. So impulse from the SA node to the AV node, then do the internodal pathways, then eventually to the bundle of his right bundle branch, and left bundle branches and then into the Purkinje fibers. So this is just a summary of the cardiac conducting system. I do not have to read this for you, but try to understand on exactly what happens. So eventually from the SA node to the AV node, the bundle of this, the right bundle branch and left bundle branch, obviously the right bundle branch goes to the right ventricle, left bundle branch goes to the left ventricle, and in the ventricle you have your, from the bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers which will be the one responsible for making the muscles contract. So again, this is just to show you the presence of the SA node there, simulating the left and right atrium at the same time, contract, contract at the same time in both right and left atrium, the valves will open on both sides at the same time, blood will flow, blood will flow at the same time. So as the, as the blood is going down here, this will also go here to the right and left bundle branches and Purkinje fibers. So when this gets filled with blood, they both contract the left and right ventricles contract at the same time to bring blood, in the case of the right, to the lung via the pulmonary tract and pulmonary arteries and in the case of the left ventricle to the aorta to the different organs of the body. So just familiarize yourself with this. At the same time, the same thing, conducting system and cardiac cycles. So, as I said, the more you will get to understand this, the better because you can see here the effect of the muscle contraction is due to the electrical stimulation. In other words, in order for the muscles to contract, you have to have this electrical stimulation coming from, of course, the SA node, then AV node, then bundle branches, right bundle branch, left bundle branch, and then eventually by the Purkinje fibers. So you will notice this will happen at the same time, simultaneously. Same thing here, same time, blood goes down, and then when you get this filled with blood, then eventually it will make muscles contract. This goes to the lung, from the right ventricle and from the left ventricle, into the systemic circulation via the aorta and the arteries. So this is just to show you the relationship between muscle contraction and electrical stimulation provided by the um, conduction system and the pacemakers of the heart. See, I don't expect you to memorize the slide, but at least just get to see the role played by the electrical stimulation provided by the, uh, the pacemakers of the heart. So it is the primary pacemaker, that's why it's set the heart rate. 
but, but, but can be altered by uh, the impulses from the autonomic nervous system. And again, uh, associated with ANS, which is autonomic nervous system, innervate the SAAV node cardiac cells, that's both muscles in the cardiac blood vessels. Now remember, norepinephrine and epinephrine and acetylcholine, so they have effects. So this is, the norepinephrine is part of sympathetic, as you can recall, it increases what? Increases heart rate and force of contractions of the myocardium. On the other hand, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter from the parasympathetic nervous system, causing the opposite of norepinephrine from sympathetic, which means this will cause the heart to decrease in the heart rate and decrease in the force of contractions. Now, the cardiac center is in the medulla oblongata, which is part of the brainstem. It is a structure in the brain. It's right above the spinal cord. It is the uh, modified heart rate by stimulation of the cardioaccelatory center, activating the sympathetic neurons. Heart rate increases, but you also have what we call the cardioinhibitory center in the medulla, which of course will stimulate parasympathetic via the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is also known as cranial nerve number 10. It will decrease the heart rate. So this is just to show you the presence of the cardioinhibitory and accelatory center within the medulla oblongata. The one that is inhibitory is via the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10, which slows down the heart rate. So parasympathetic slows down heart rate. Sympathetic increases heart rate via the neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. Okay, okay that's it. So again, this is a very important topic. The number one cause of death in the United States is heart disease, so be familiar with the function of the heart, okay?